the uh, or ask if you have some questions. Which you actually did have a question. I appreciate that. I guess the other rule on questions is uh, you can ask me whatever you want. Just like the morning today, it was a question about a, a question on a quiz. I said that to one class about ten years ago, and I'd come in each morning and they would have a question for me. They had nothing to do with the previous day's lecture. And it took me two or three, three days to realize they were asking me questions on their homeworks from another course they were taking. Okay? <laughs> so, okay, fine. I don't mind trying to answer. Um, run out of the evening. Who didn't get both? One, who doesn't have both set one and two of the notes? Two sets? Okay, there's two sets. Which, which one? Set two. Set two. Here's one more set, too. You, let's see. There's, I'll have to have Jerry give me, here's another set, too. I have one more person back there that doesn't have set, two. Two more people don't have set, two. Okay, well, Jerry's got more. I'll just have to. There's no particular reading time for today. I'll bring some in tomorrow. There's no more set one. Oh, wait a second. Here's, oh, that's one. Oh, there are more set, you need some more set ones? I didn't get set one. Okay, fine. Yeah, okay. I'll, I'll bring in two or three more of both next time. Hopefully, everybody can get something. Uh, also, people, we ran out of this materials research. This is the synopsis of the materials selection stuff. At least there weren't any left over. Does anybody not have this? Okay. We'll get it all straight. Um, that one? Uh, yes, it is the same thing. Yeah, it just has the, this one just has the cover page. Uh, okay. You don't need to know where it comes from. Uh, okay, so, um, so I'll take questions in general, but one, if, we, if you didn't have a question, what I was going to tell you today is about one of the world's first energy crises, okay? And it turns out that it wasn't the oil embargo of uh, 1973. Uh, it was the fact that in England, around 50, in the 16th century, in the 1500s, they had been, uh, they had, they had a, a long-standing use of wood. We're gonna talk a little bit more today about wood and why it's a structural material. But the primary, one of the primary uses of wood was for building ships. And ships were there for national security. Now another thing for national security was to build cannons to go on this, these ships. And to do that, they needed to make cast iron. To make cast iron, they had been using um, charcoal for years. And as you know, England was having wars with France and with Spain and others, they needed to build more ships more, make more cannons, and to make um, cast iron, you need, you need at that time, you need a charcoal. When you get charcoal, everybody know how charcoal is made? You basically stack up a bunch, you go out and fell a bunch of trees, stack it up, cover the whole thing with dirt, and light a fire inside, and just let enough air come in to burn away the lignin out of the wood and leave behind the, the, the carbon as charcoal, okay? So it's partially burned wood, and you've burned off all the volatiles off the wood and leave behind something that's carbon, which is a cleaner, hotter burning fuel than wood. Wood has got all these volatiles, the volatiles cause it to burn and it makes a nice flame, okay? Pretty to sit around the fireside, but it's not as good and as hot uh, to, to make cast iron, to reduce the ore. And you're using the carbon not only to reduce the ore, but just like in this hull cell, uh, the carbon is actually consuming some of the oxygen out of the iron to help produce the, the iron, uh, metallic iron, to produce the ore. So they were cutting down a bunch of trees to make charcoal, to make uh, um, uh, cast iron for cannons and other things. Um, they didn't make nails. Um, nails were so valuable back then. It was so expensive to make a ton of cast iron or wrought iron that Back in those days, when a house got to be old, they would burn down the house just to recover the nails and the ashes so they could reuse them, okay? Nails have gotten cheaper. We don't burn down the houses to re recover the nails. And that's partly because the product, and this is something we'll talk about in a little bit, 
is the productivity of steel. It probably took one person year to make a ton of steel back in 1600. Okay, and today it takes about 0.8 hours, 0.8 man hours to make a ton of steel. Okay, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. How that's changed? It was probably five or ten person hours in 1980. And so just in the last 30 years, it's dropped by a tremendous amount. Um, so we'll talk about that in terms of manufacturing a little bit later today. But what I wanted to talk about, there was a third thing that came along, and that was making glass. In order to make glass, you had to have a very clean fire. You didn't want to get all kinds of dirt particles in your glass because it just wasn't clear. And so they needed to have good quality fuel, charcoal, to make glass. And so they were deforesting England, okay, in the late 1500s. And this is a book called Out of the Fiery Furnace. It's, there's a series of PBS broadcasts about the history of metals, basically, and metallurgy, uh, what came out of the fire, fire, fiery furnace. It said, in 1558, a law was passed forbidding the felling of trees to make coals for the burning of iron. Burning of iron meaning making cast iron. But the Weld of King of Kent, Weld is W-E-A-L-D, which means the, well, the, the region or the, the forest of Kent and Sussex, was exempted. Well, that's where they were doing it. So it's typical politicians. They, you know, the, the lobbyists were saying, you know, don't pass this law, and they said, well, we have to pass the law, so we'll, uh, we'll pass the law to apply everywhere that it doesn't need to, okay? And we'll exempt the, the area that needs to be controlled, right? So they, perhaps because of lobbying by the thriving iron industry in that area, still the price of wood continued to climb. In 1559, a writer complained that the price had risen from a penny to two shillings a load by reason of the iron mills. By 1581, the shortage of wood for shipbuilding was so serious that a further act was passed forbidding the felling of trees within 22 miles of the Thames, Thames River, within four miles of the great forests of the Weld, and within three miles of the coastline anywhere. The decree effectively wiped out the iron making industries of the Weld, but the consumption of wood by the glass, and glass makers continued, and so did the domestic demand from city dwellers as people were moving from rural areas to the cities. We got these same problems today. Um, by 1615, England was facing, facing an energy crisis. A royal proclamation in that year lamented the disappearance of the kind of wood, quote, which is not only great and large in height and bulk, but hath also that toughness and heart, as it is not subject to rive or cleave, thereby of excellent use for shipping. And so at last, that country was forced to turn to a source of fuel which had been known for centuries but which few had chosen to use, coal, okay? So they solved the process, the problem, <laughs> the energy crisis, by going to coal. And their, their hypothesis in this little book is uh, basically um, that's where steam engines came in. Because first they went and they collected sea coal. Well, sea coal is nothing more than where a coal seam comes up to the ocean and the ocean would wear away the coal seam, and you would have little lumps of coal that you could pick up off the beaches. Uh, I always wondered why the national, we had a national petroleum reserve back in 1900 up on the north slope of Alaska. Who was dwelling, drilling for oil on the north slope of Alaska in 1900? Anybody know the answer to that? The answer's no one. It was just bubbling out of the ground, okay? The Eskimos, which, a derogatory term nowadays. Um, it's now native people, okay? They, native nations, <laughs> original nations, that's what they call them. Original nations. It, first they were called Native Americans, and then you can't call them Native Americans because America Vespucci wasn't even from this, this continent. So then they had to start calling them original nations. So you call the people who live up north the original nations. Anybody here from Canada? Canada, you would know these things. But anyway, uh, so this is have to do with what this has to do with material selection. But they argue in this out of the fiery furnace that after they ran out of sea coal, just picking it up off, off the beaches and stuff, and the seams that came open to the ground, they had to start mining for it. And when you started mining for it, you ran into groundwater. 
you ran into groundwater, you had to pump the water out of the mines. You had to have steam engines to do that. And the owners of the mines needed to know that they were actually make, digging out more coal than the coal they were using to run their steam engines to pump the water out. Because otherwise you don't make much money if you're using all your product to empty the mine. And so, if you follow this through, the entire science of thermodynamics came out of the energy crisis of the 1500s. And if you want to learn more about this, you can go up here to Saugus Ironworks, um, which was started in like 1630. And why did they do it? They had an energy crisis in England and they were running out of big trees. And so they actually sent iron makers over here to the New World in the early 1620s to set up an iron furnace. And they did it right up here in Saugus, Massachusetts. If you want to go see how they made iron in 1630 or 1640, they eventually went bankrupt up there, but, but now it's a national historical site. And that's another thing. I gave you a thing about what MIT is all about. You also ought to learn a few things while you're here about what's in the Boston area. Um, first, first challenge for you is to find out about the glass flowers. Okay? About what? The glass flowers. Okay? It's a good thing to do, especially on a rainy day. But you have to, I'm going to let you figure out where it is. It's, it's actually, it's a long walk from here, but it's not too far from here. It's in Cambridge. How about a day then? And then I have some other things, like where's the blue silhouette of Ho Chi Minh here in Boston. That's not quite as good as it used to be. I used to ask freshmen to do this back 20 years ago. And the last last one I usually say is you have to track down where Mrs. Mrs. Hawthorne engraved a poem using her diamond ring on a glass uh, window pane, okay, in one of the buildings here in uh, eastern Massachusetts. So anyway, so the first one is to figure out where the glass flowers are. Good taste, good place to take, uh, well, most of you have little kids, but good place if you're married to take your spouse, okay, go see the glass flowers. It's the most unique thing in Boston, and you won't even find it in most of the guidebooks. Okay, so there. You've been here for a year, and you've never heard of it, right? No, but I think I found that Hawthorne thing. Oh, you did? I went okay. up to Lexington Concord last weekend. Yeah. Drove right by Hawthorne's house. I didn't see what you were talking about. It wasn't Hawthorne's house. It was at Emerson's house. But the Hawthorne's were living there. It's called the Old Man's, right? And it's right, looks out on the root bridge that arched the flood, okay? So where the shot occurred around the world and all that stuff. So that's, so we've already got the answer to that. The Old Man's up in Lexington and Concord, and Mrs. Hawthorne, the Hawthorne's when they first got married, I'm pretty sure it was Hawthorne's, and Nathaniel Hawthorne's <coughs> wife needed a place to live. They rented the Old Man's from the Emersons, to the Emerson family. And they had a child there, and if you go in there and take a little tour, I think they charge you for it now. But it used to be free. But she had her little one or two year old daughter looking out of an ice storm, and uh, the trees were all covered with ice. And so she writes this little poem, she scribes it in there with her diamond ring and the window pane. It's still there. And it talks about her little daughter looking out on the glass chandeliers, okay, which the trees covered with ice. A little culture for you. So while you're here in Boston, absorb some of the culture. And now you also know about the, the first energy crisis and how it led to the science of family now. Okay? So these are important things. If you're ever at a cocktail party, um, you can ask someone, well, how did thermodynamics start? You know, if you don't have that. So now you know. Okay, one of the things I sometimes try to do is list for you some of the things from the day before. Uh, structural material selection is strongly influenced by cost. We talked about that a little bit yesterday. Steel is unique, actually <coughs> dominant among all structural materials based on cost, availability, strength, toughness, fabricability. It's actually not dominant. There are other materials that are used in larger volumes, such as okay, cement, twice the volume, stone, okay. Uh, but there's not a lot. But they don't actually have, you can't build very sophisticated things out of cement and stone. And, uh, material selection is multifaceted, and we're going to talk about that a little bit more. Now, this is the last slide I put up, and I was starting to talk about the fact that um, the cost of material is a relatively small fraction of the manufactured cost. Remember, the first one of the first slides I put up yesterday was we're going to start talking about making things, real things, you know, at the graduate school of business. Let's sue the 
University, right? Remember that joke? Well, material scientists will often <laughs> tell you how wonderful their material is. And they'll often talk about some property that it has to some exceeding value. And one of the problems is it's usually not just one property that's important. I remember um, listening uh, about 20 years ago to one of my colleagues in the department here who was a polymer scientist talking about electrically conductive polymers. Most polymers are insulators, but 20, 25 years ago, people found that if you dote polymers the right way, you could get them to be electrically conducting. And so this guy was a young faculty member and he was talking about how this was gonna revolutionize the world and uh, they were using copper in lots of applications. We talked about copper being expensive yesterday. And they're gonna be able to use electrically conductive polymers. Now, at that time they were using polyacetylene was kind of the typical material. And the only problem with polyacetylene is if you left this polymer out in the air and there was any moisture in the air, you lived anywhere other than Arizona, okay? It would just decompose from the humidity. The, the moisture would attack it, and when it decomposes, it really didn't conduct electricity very well after that. Um, so, but he's talking about. He said he got up and he said, and this is this material is going to replace copper because it has a higher specific electrical conductivity than copper. Okay. Now. I actually have a book I call it, it talks about the fallacies and pitfalls of language. And the trick there is he used specific electrical conductivity. What does specific mean? Specific uh, weight or, or whatever, it basically divides by the density. And it's absolutely true, copper has a density of nine, most polymers are around one, so he gets a factor of 10 improvement in what the way he's trying to sell this material to you by talking about the specific electrical conductivity. <coughs> And so I thought, wow, that's pretty impressive, even though it's specific. And the next morning, I almost cut myself shaving as I realized the fallacy to his logic. And he was talking about how they would replace this in rotating generators and motors and stuff. With, they wound them with copper, copper windings. And they would quit doing this because polymers have better specific strength than uh, uh, specific electrical conductivity than, than plastics. Anybody know what the fallacy there is? The I mean, we wind motors. The, huh? size of the motor would be enormous? Um, no, actually, if it, well, you're actually, it would be. But that's, that's, that, that's actually an excellent answer. It, but the way I thought about it was, at the time, as I thought, wait a second. Aluminum has got a better specific electrical conductivity than copper right now. But we don't build large electrical generators out of aluminum, aluminum is available as an electrically conductive wire today, even 25 years ago. But General Electric, up here in Lynn, Massachusetts, which is the beginning of General Electric. By the way, does anybody know who started General Electric? Two guys, Thomas Edison and a guy named Elihu Thompson. Well, most of you heard of Thomas Edison. He was had the most patents of anybody in the country, about 400. Most people haven't heard of Elihu Thompson. He had the second most patents, 380. He was about 5% behind Edison. But L. Hugh Thompson was basically a professor of electrical engineering here at MIT. And he, for one year, was acting president of MIT. So General Electric was basically started by a professor here at MIT. And it was started right up here in Lynn, Massachusetts, uh, near the Saugus Iron Works and stuff. Um, but in any case, this argument that polymers, electrically conductive polymers would replace copper because it had a better specific electrical conductivity. Well, they were playing a game with the word specific. It really had about five times lower electrical conductivity than copper. But if you really wanted to have something with low specific or high specific electrical conductance, you wouldn't build generators out of copper, you'd make them out of aluminum. The problem is when you make great big generators or great big motors, you need to make them small and you also need to not generate too much heat inside them because you have to get the heat out of them. Okay, they actually run water cooling through some of these things to cool them down. <coughs> so if, if you wanted something with better 
specific electrical conductivity, you would have used aluminum. So he was using the wrong metric. And this is one of the typical things when you hear a material scientists, remember I gave you Bob Sprague's quote, whenever you first hear about the properties of a new material, write it down because those are the best properties you'll ever have. Well, in designing a product out of some material, it's not one specific thing like strength. The composites guys will say, oh, well, this is stronger than such and such. And if they, if they can't do it on an absolute basis, they do it on a specific basis. And they don't tell you that it's brittle as can be, or it can't be repaired, or it can't be all these other things. Okay? So selection of a material is multi multifaceted. You have to be able to repair it. You have to be able to uh, afford it. Uh, we've talked about some of those things. But part of affording something is realizing that only 10% of the cost of making something is actually buying the raw materials. And it, it varies, but not over a tremendous tremendous margin. Now, if that's the case, and we also have this little thing that I gave you that the value of a pound saved in an automobile it is $2 a pound over the life of the vehicle. So we can now look at, better brighten that up a little, and figure out what materials you can use to build an automobile. If the the value is $2 a pound, but only 10% of that can be the cost <coughs> of the materials. Because it's $2 a pound of fabricated, right? That's the 100% cost. If 10% of the cost is the material cost, that means you can't afford to pay more than 20 cents a pound, which means on a per ton basis, it's got to cost less than $400 a ton, okay? Well, you can see you can make cars out of cement, coal, concrete, cast iron, mild steel sort of marginal. Okay. So why do we make steel cars? It's the only thing we can afford to make them out of. When the value of a pound saved is two dollars a pound. Now, if you're talking an Audi, well, people are paying a lot more than two dollars a pound or whatever for for Audis um, that are made out of aluminum. Now, if I'm talking about a uh, an aircraft at two hundred dollars a pound, that's forty. That's uh, uh, $200 a, a pound savings, That's that means I can pay, what, uh, 20, 20 cents or $20 a pound for the material. Um, and you find that you can build aircraft out of something like this, okay? Aluminum, titanium, nickel. Uh, if you want to get to spacecraft, cobalt alloys, boron epoxy composites, and things like that. So. You really have to look at what piece of equipment you're buying and what the value per pound of that is when you're talking structural material. Because we really buy structural materials by the pound, by and large, um, compared to other things. So it's multifaceted. There are multiple dimensions to this. And I mentioned Ashley's book on material selection and mechanical design. And this little appendix, which is not copyrighted because he encourages you to copy these things which are now called Ashby, Ashby plots. And here, well, actually I have a bunch of Ashby plots. Ashby plots are log-log plots. And anybody who knows anything about log-log plots, you can fit everything in the world onto a log-log plot. Okay? And this is what he's done. He's fit everything into the world, in the world onto a log-log plot here. And he's going over, what, five orders of to? Uh, here on strength versus relative cost. So this is strength, and that's a fundamental property for a structural material. Um, and one of the things he actually does, he adds a lot of science to this, um, which is why these have become important, and why you can buy a $50,000 computer program from his company that will help you do this. Um, but there's certain things. This is the C factor, which is the slope which is the strength divided by the cost and the density. So this is relative cost. This is a specific cost. And that's one metric. And he plots that over five orders of magnitude. And you can see you'd like to be cheap over on this end of the cost curve. You'd like to be strong, so you'd like to be up in this search region. And what are the materials that are both cheap and relatively strong? And remember I told you people use cement 
and stone in very high volumes. And that's why the third world is building all this new concrete stuff, because it's cheap. But if you want something that has a little bit better fracture properties, not just strength, mild steel and cast iron are actually out here up in this, this corner. And the slope you ought to be looking at are these types of slopes, depending on the specific mechanical equations for whether it's rotating, whether it's a sphere, whether it's a cylinder. And you can go through his book, and it will give you some of the basic equations. Spheres have, spherical pressure vessels have different strength requirements than cylindrical pressure vessels based on the geometry, okay? Uh, there's some fundamental equations. So polymers are here. This is Teflon. It's very expensive for its strength. Silicones are down here. This is polyurethane, not plutonium. Uh, plutonium will be way over here somewhere on cost. But ceramics are up here, okay? So ceramics, that's why in the, when I lived in Japan in the mid-1980s, they actually called it ceramics fever. And they had a public conference on fine ceramics in 1985 in Tokyo. We had two million people come to this. I mean, you know, in the United States, you couldn't get two million people if they thought they were making ashtrays out of fine ceramics, okay? Uh, but the Japanese are very interested in technology. And they, this was when they were predicting that they were going to build automo automobile engines out of ceramics because of the great, uh, great high temperature strength and relatively co low cost in some cases. This is modulus, which is stiffness, okay, Young's modulus versus weld. And here's your stone brick, cast iron. You basically have just kind of distorted things from the previous strength, okay? Strength and modulus are somewhat related, not exactly. But it turns out there are two factors that determine the real fracture properties of the material. In the 1880s, we learned to quantify the strength in terms of the stress. Okay. People knew, you know, back in the early 1800s and the 1700s, whether a piece of ash was stronger than a piece of pine, okay? Farmers knew that. But they really hadn't quantified it. And so in the 1850s through the 1880s, engineers were coming into prominence. In fact, engineering really didn't. Have I told you the story about engineering? Okay. Uh, the first engineering school in the country was, you might know, West Point, 1797. The second engineering school in the country was Ressler Polytechnic in Troy, New York in 1823. Now it turns out engineering really didn't <coughs> exist in the 1600s. There were scientists, there was the arts and the sciences, okay? And the church was kind of suspicious of both, okay? Uh, but it didn't matter which church we're talking about. Trying to be religious here. <laughs> the, the religious people were, were suspicious of Copernicus and others. Okay. Uh, and Galileo and stuff. Anyway, um, engineering really started in France at a a coal polytechnic. Okay, in the in the earlier 1700s and before 1797. But the word engineer comes from the French, which means maker of war machines. And so engineers were people who built bridges, breastworks, catapults, and things like that, okay? Uh, and so the first engineering, um, uh, engineering school was West Point. And until 1844, the commandant of West Point had to come from the Army Corps of Engineers, okay? Because it was their engineering school. In 1823, RPI opened up. And why would you want an engineering school in New York State in 1823. Yeah, Erie Canal. The Erie Canal, exactly. And so they had one course of study, and they called it civil engineering as to distinguish it from what they did at West Point, which was military engineering. So now you know why we call it civil engineering, to distinguish it from military. Now, University of Michigan and some others started some engineering schools, but they, they weren't very prominent. The next prominent school was a place called MIT in 1861 through 65. They didn't start until 65. Um, and MIT, course number one is civil engineering. Course number two is mechanical. And course number three, well, forget that, it's material science, but back in 1865, it was the Department of Mining. 
Okay. Uh, and then it became Metallurgy in 1888, Metallurgy and Mining. Anyway, um, so that's kind of the uh, history of engineering. But So we learned about strength there in the 1850s to 1880s. But then the next big thing during World War II, we had a number of failures of ships. Uh, typically the people talk about the Liberty ships. And it turns out we had, um, we, we actually um, started to increase the amount of welding in the world. So this is partly a welding course. Uh, there should be enough of these. Um, I'll give you a little bit of the history of, of that welding. This article just came out um, this month in the Welding Journal. Uh, and really it's only the first two pages here by Homer Blodgett, which talks about welding in the, in the 1940s in the United States. Welding really didn't get to come into, I mean, welding's been done for thousands of years. Forgers used to, forger, I'm not talking about forgers who wrote checks, but I'm talking about the forgers who used to make swords and stuff, and plows and stuff. They would weld things together by beating them together in a uh, blacksmith's forge. But welding didn't come into prominence, even though Sir Humphrey Davy invented the electric, or discovered the electric arc in 1805 or so, thereabouts. Uh, it didn't come into prominence until the days of Edison and Westinghouse, when all of a sudden we had a ready source of electricity. Okay, then you could start doing arc welding. So arc welding came in in the 1880s. In World War I, they actually put together something called the Emergency Fleet Committee. They had to build ships to get the boys over there. You couldn't fly them back in those days. And the guy who was in charge of the Emergency Fleet Committee was a professor of electrical engineering up here at Harvard named Comfort Adams. And Comfort Adams was, uh, um, had developed welding power supplies and things like that for arc welding. And he was put in charge of this. And they wanted to weld ships, but kind of the war was over before they really figured out how to do it. But Comfort Adams thought, well, welding is really an important thing. And so in 1921, he formed the American Welding Society. Okay. Welding still wasn't very high quality for things. <coughs> the first critical structure was built in 1931. They built a gas pipe or yeah, a gas pipeline from Louisiana to New Jersey called the Big Inch. It was like a 30-inch diameter pipeline, gas pipeline, to bring the energy up to the, the marketplace. And it was critical technology, and that's one where 30% you know, of the cost of a pipeline is the steel you make it out of. And you didn't want to have to rivet that and all the problems you'd have with leaking gas. Okay, can you imagine? So they chose to weld it. But welding was, still wasn't very prominent until World War II. And in World War II, it really took off. And actually, one of the reasons I copied this is the second paragraph in here. In 1931, the United States produced almost 16 million pounds of welding electrodes. Last year, 1944, we produced over a billion pounds. Okay, um, and then the next paragraph down, it says they were using, they went from using 4.8 pounds of welding electrodes in 32 for every ton of steel produced to using almost 50 pounds of electrode for every ton of finished steel. Um, so there are, now I'm gonna tell you something that has to do with how to estimate things and where data comes from, okay? So it turns out uh, one time about 30 years ago, I was supposed to give a talk at the American Welding Society and I was curious and wanted to figure out approximately how many welders are in the, in the country. There are about 50,000 members of the American Welding Society, but certainly most of those people who weld don't subscribe to the welding journal. So I tried to estimate it, and I had the data of how many pounds of electrodes, and you can go to the welding handbook and find that typical shielded metal art, typical guy weighs, weighs down about five pounds an hour if he's welding continuously. So I divided all the numbers and I came up with a number like 750,000. I said, well, they're not all full-time welders. Maybe a half a million are, are full-time welders and the other people just weld part-time, like some farmer or auto mechanic or whatever. So I said, well, there's half a million full-time welders and there's one and a half million part-time welders. Just kind of pull those numbers out of the air based on the number of pounds of electrodes sold, right? So about 20 years later, it's about 10 years ago, they come out with the ninth edition of the welding handbook and I look in there and they quote that there are half a million welders in the United States. And this is, the source they give is the Bureau of Labor Statistics, which is part of the US government. 
And I thought, well, that's interesting. I'd like to find out how they came. They got the same number I did. So I called the Welling Society and say, where'd you get this quote for the Bureau of Labor Statistics? And they said, well, actually, they got it from us, but we got it from you. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, I know where that came from. <laughs> I know how rigorous the calculation was, too. Okay, but I did, I did it again, okay, when this came out. I did it yesterday morning. If you use 50 pounds per ton, that's 5% of all the, or 2.5% of all the steel. It goes into welding electrodes. I happen to know we use about 130 million tons of steel in the world, and that, if you go through and multiply that all out, you get about 700,000 welders. Whereas I'd calculated 750,000 30 years ago. So the numbers work out. Um, it's amazing how close you can get on, on estimating some things. But anyway, what happened in World War II was they built a bunch of ships. The welding grew by leaps and bounds. Uh, the Lincoln Electric Company and a few others became the dominant players in the welding industry in the world. Um, but they had a problem. Do you know how long it was taking them to build the Liberty ship at the height of production? From laying of keel to floating it away? It's really short, like under a month? Under two days. weeks, yeah, less than two weeks. weeks. It was about two weeks. They could lay the keel and drive it away, okay? Um, but they had some problems because a certain fraction of them fell apart. Um, there was a study done, commissioned by the um, to convene by order of the Secretary of the Navy to inquire, so that means, you know, they had a budget, right? The design and methods of construction of welded merchants, the welded steel merchant vessels, 15 July 1946. This is 1947. This was the MIT edition. They were throwing it out. One of my students picked it up for two months <coughs> in the MIT libraries um, and gave it to me. But of 4,694 vessels, uh, 970, pretty good fraction, 1,000 out of 4,500, suffered casualties involving fractures. 24 vessels sustained a complete fracture of the strength deck. One vessel sustained a complete fracture of the bottom. Eight vessels were lost, four broke in two, four were abandoned after fracture occurred, four additional vessels broke in two but were not lost. 26 lives were lost in the incident of structural failures, and blah, blah, blah. What was okay. the total number of ships? 4,694. This was uh, Liberty ships plus T1 tankers, okay, which are basically said, I think they were sort of the same hull design, the one was a tanker. Um, but I'll pass this around. This is a fairly famous picture of the Schenectady sitting at dry dock and just basically split in two, okay? And this is in a lot of textbooks now, <coughs> textbooks. But this has a few other pictures in here. There's a whole series of plates. Here's the ship. Or a half a ship, okay? See the cross section. Um, uh, uh, pretty <coughs> much. Oh, here's one. Here's one at sea, okay? Split two. Okay. Um, so you can look at that. Well, what happened was um, because of this problem of ships cracking. They needed to understand it. And if you read Omer Blodgett, he kind of gives you a modern day version because he worked in the shipyard. If you just read these two pages, it was really just one page, but it's mostly pictures on the other page. Uh, uh, Omer went to work for Lincoln Electric and wrote a bunch of welding books that are very, very widely used for welding design. But after the war, there were three places where a lot of research was done. One was done at the Naval Research Lab by a guy named William Pellini, uh, Naval Research Lab in Washington, D.C. Another was a place, there was a guy, um, Sir Rick, he became Sir Richard Weck, but Richard Weck was a young engineer, and he was pedaling away from Cambridge, in England, on his bicycle, and he found this little field in Abington, England, outside of Cambridge, and he said, we should build a welding institute so he went and convinced the British government, and now we have the Welding Institute in England, which is the most prominent welding authority in the world, okay? Um, and it was started by the British government. And they were started to study the fracture of these ships. 
uh, of course, the Naval Research Lab. And the third place was right here in this department, Professor Cohen, who just passed away a couple of years ago, who was an institute professor here at MIT, was asked to look at the metallurgy of the steels and why these steels crack. So those were the three places where people really studied the fracture of these steels. And they found it wasn't just strength. Since 1880, everybody thought it had been strength that was what you needed, the strength of fracture. But what they learned, it was not just strength, it was energy of fracture. Strength is the force of fracture. Toughness is the energy of fracture. So they started studying toughness. And in that report, they, they found when they took an old test, the Sharpie test, which is about um, uh, 500, uh, 105 years old now or so, a French guy named Sharpie, C-H-A-R-P-Y, took a little one centimeter square steel bar, 10 centimeters long, put a little two millimeter notch in it, and he would whack it with a calibrated hammer, and he would find out how much energy was absorbed in fracturing the steel. And they found that of the ships that broke completely in two, where the crack started, the steel had less than five foot pounds of fracture energy. And so the recommendation in that book was basically we should make sure that we only use steel that has 10 foot-pounds of fracture energy. And that was sort of 1947. And by 1960, the Coast, the Coast Guard was saying, or other people were starting to say, well, we need a little margin here. Of course, that report doubled it to give you some margin. But people said, oh, we need margin. So they went to 15 foot-pounds. And by 1970, the Coast Guard was saying, oh, we need some margin. So they went to 20 foot pounds, okay? So over the next 20 years, we kind of doubled our margin, or tripled, quadrupled our margin, because nobody actually looked back at the history to see what the real criteria was. But, so we've kind of stayed at 20 foot pounds, although in 1975, when I worked for the steel company, they were talking about building the Alaskan pipeline, and they were talking about toughness as of 60 and 70 foot pounds, okay? And actually, today, most of the steel we make, we now pay attention to getting the sulfur and the oxygen control to levels to give us much better toughness, such that a good piece of steel plate today probably will give you 60 foot pounds. But I remember in 1975, I was working on developing a new steel for Bethlehem Steel, because they were down here in Quincy, they had a shipyard in Quincy once upon a time, okay? In fact, it was operating back then, and it was owned by Bethlehem Steel even. They were building LNG tankers, and the steel skirt that was going to make the cylinder that held this big aluminum sphere that was going to hold the liquid natural gas, the Coast Guard had a requirement that those had to have 20 foot-pounds at minus 60 degrees Fahrenheit, okay? Now, it turns out the only way the steel mill in the United States could meet that requirement was to normalize the steel, which means you stick it in the furnace, you heat it up, you know, it cool down slowly, and you get a very fine grain size, and that would give you good toughness, and that was great. Uh, the problem was Bethlehem Steel had to double and triple normalize these plates to get them to pass, and the average passing value was 21 foot-pounds, okay? So they were right on the edge, and to double normalize meant they failed the first time, and triple normalize means it had failed the first two tests, and they, had to, they only finally got it through the third test. And if it didn't pass the third time, they decided to scrap it, okay? But they were just barely passing. And so every now and then, they would get a plate that would be 27 or 28 foot-pounds, because there's a statistical variation on these things. So what would they do? They'd segregate out that plate down here at Quincy. Then we cut it up into the, to the test plates, okay? And when you make the weld, you might be trying to weld these two plates together, but you put a runoff tab at the end of this. And that's where you get your Sharpie specimens for this weld. Well, the runoff tabs were all made out of plate of 28 foot-pounds, whereas the stuff you were welding was 21 foot-pounds. It sounds like they were gaming the system a little bit. Duh. But we already had a 400% safety factor, right? And none of those vessels have failed for that reason. Okay, but yeah, I mean, this the point is, people find ways to game the system, right? That was my experience with gaming the system. Okay, so so they just find the good plates. Uh, 
But nowadays, it's not as big a problem. Nonetheless, if I look at toughness versus strength, strength is how much force it takes to break something. One of the strongest materials we know is glass. Okay, If you take nice, fresh glass and you pull it into a fiber to make fiberglass, those fibers are as strong as steel for the next 15 minutes. Unless you're in Arizona, it might last for a couple of hours because there's less humidity. But the moisture in the air will actually attack the glass okay, over a few hours, and the glass will get substantially weaker and brittle because glass inherently very strong, but very brittle, very low toughness. Any little notch will weaken it. The example I like to give of toughness, which I'm actually on the History Channel doing this, people say, oh, I saw you on the History Channel. They did some documentary on the Titanic, anyway, and they came to me. So I can take a piece of paper. Paper turns out to be a brittle material, okay? And I can pull on the edge with several pounds of force. But if I put a notch in it, it takes ounces. So as Bob Sprague, that guiding light from General Electric, once said, when he was knocking material scientists. Material scientists think that properties are controlled by microstructure. Metallurgists just know that properties are controlled by defects, okay? So um, properties are controlled, st structural properties are controlled by notches, flaws, whether they be metallurgical in the structure or whether they be actually be a notch. Glass will break where the notch is. Uh, my old thesis advisor used to stop by the Sylvania glass plant. He lived up on the North Shore, and when he would teach freshman chemistry 30 years ago, he would stop by in the morning and get some freshly made light bulbs. And he would take them into 10 250 and we would throw them across the room, and they would bounce because they didn't have any notches in them yet. But if he did that on a day old light bulb, it would just shatter or hit the wall. Glass is very strong, and if it has no defects, it won't fracture very easily. The problem is it doesn't take a very big defect in something as brittle as glass, because glass has very low toughness, okay? Toughness, something that has a lot of toughness is rubber. Rubber, rubber will stretch into form, and I told you glass, uh, paper was a brittle material. Proof? A brittle material, when you try to put it back together, makes perfectly. There's no deformation. You break an ashtray or a glass goblet or something, you can glue the whole thing right back together, right? Paper is the same way. There's no deformation of that paper. There might be fibers across there, but it doesn't matter. Macroscopically, there's no deformation. So one of the first things, you can look on a fracture and see if it deformed before it broke. If it deformed before it broke, no problem, okay? I had a situation once, uh, some guy was in prison in Florida, but he had worked on a ship out in the Pacific, and this ship was towing some secret object under the water. And some Navy long underwater vessel was following this towed thing. Is this why the guy was in prison? No, he was in prison for drugs, I think. But he was just working on this. This was a contractor. Actually, Johns Hopkins University was the contractor for towing this array, which is obviously some sort of sonar array or whatever, right? And it, but it's all whatever, whatever they were doing was classified, okay? But we knew they were towing, and it had a 2,000 foot line. I guess I'm not supposed to say something like that, right? But anyway, it had a, the the line we knew was about they were towing about 2,000 feet deep, and the seas were like 30 foot seas, okay? And so. Um, the, uh, so the, the ship's up here, and it's got this line going down 2,000 feet to this whole thing is towing, and there's this other little thing over here, okay? Okay. Um, and this thing on the ship had a pad on it, which is just a one-inch thick piece of steel with a hole in it, and it was fillet welded. And what happened is in the swells of the sea, this thing 2,000 feet deep couldn't respond to the, sw the swell frequency. And so you would stretch this line, 
And I calculated just based on a Young's modulus how much force you could put on this thing based on some of the angles that we had and stuff. And you were going to get a tremendous force up here. But I knew that anyway because when you looked at the pad eye itself, which was just a piece of flame cut steel, had a flat side that had been welded here, the hole was no longer circular, it was elliptical. And this thing was no longer shaped like it was originally. They bent this one inch thick piece of steel with a one inch hole in it. It was now an elliptical hole. Duh. And so I said, most of the welds had stayed there. We just had kind of a rusty fracture surface here. But this had pulled off and hit this guy in the head. And you know, he was disabled and they had to helicopter him off the ship. And it was only six months later that he got put in prison for some felony. But he was suing. Johns Hopkins and the Navy and everybody else in the world because he wanted to become a rich man in prison. I don't know what you do with a rich man in prison is to buy more drugs or something, but um, he had an expert from an unknown school in Gainesville, Florida, uh, who said, oh, defective welds. I said, no, it's not a defective weld. The metal bent before the weld broke. If you deform the metal, the base metal, this is just a one inch steel plate before the weld broke, you can't blame the weld, okay? No one designs metals to deform under load, okay? So anyway, that was a story about how you can tell in failure analysis whether something's behaving in a brittle manner or whether the weld's defective. I run into that all the time. People say, oh, the weld broke. I don't care if the weld broke. Did the metal bend first? If it did, don't blame the weld, okay? Start looking for other things. In this case, with 30 foot C's, you couldn't, you, you needed to have a little more slack in that line. You needed some angles and stuff, okay? They were just running this thing a little, a little too straight in the water, okay? Um, but anyway, so getting back to toughness, when we look at a material, we learned after Pellini and Cohen and Richard Weck that you need to study not only the strength of a material, but the toughness of a material. And here's the uh, Ashby plot for fracture toughness versus strength. And this gets to be, if you're looking for a structural material, this is sort of the fundamental plot. Because this is not only the force of fracture, it's the energy of fracture. Okay? And what you want is to yield before fracture. If you're brittle, you fracture before you yield. And you don't like that because you can't predict brittle fractures very well. And we have polymer foams way down here, low fracture toughness, low strength. Sandy National Lab has developed these aerogels, lightest things in the world. They have like a hundredth the density of water. Okay, they're made of air. And they, they talk about, oh, they may have to be very strong, but look at their specific strength. Yeah, well. It turns out if you blow on them, they, they're kind of like firefighting foam, you know, they blow over. Anyway, the specific criteria for fracture is either the toughness, which we call K, divided by the stress, that's the criteria, or K squared divided by the stress, depending on what type of fracture you're talking about. So these are the guidelines, the slopes you'd be interested in for what we call safe design, where you yield before fracturing. And now if I look at this, where are my ceramics? Well, my ceramics are way down here, okay? Their fracture toughness is not very good. And this is strength over here, right? So they're very strong. Remember, ceramics were the strongest materials. But their toughness is lousy. I want to be up in this corner. And up in this corner, here are all my metals. Here are my engineering composites down in here. Composites can match the engineering alloys, but not the best engineering alloys. Here are cast irons. Cast irons are better than ceramics. When the ceramics, when people were so interested in the ceramics in the 1980s, I, in the late 1980s, I used to give a talk and I said, I used to talk about the fact that ceramics are not going to take over the world of structural materials because they have lousy fracture toughness. And the people who study ceramics don't seem to understand that. For example, the largest use of ceramics, I used to say, was Portland cement. 
and I throw in the kitchen sink, except you have to line it with cast iron to give it fracture toughness. Okay? Which is in fact true. If you had a pure ceramic sink and you dropped a coffee pot in there, you're probably able to shatter your sink. But if you make it out of cast iron, <laughs> you can take the dropping of the, the pot into the sink. If you want to look at your polymers, they're sort of on a similar level, but much lower strength. Okay? But I'm interested in, in something going along here. So anything along this line is equal. Ceramics are way down here. Plastics are as good as metals, just not as strong. Okay? And if I want to look at rocks and things like that, they're, they're worse. Okay? And glasses, here's glasses down here. Here's ice. Okay? So there it is. There's the plot in Ashby terms. But before, um, before Ashby, well, let me back up. Um, so that's, and if you look at that, it turns out there are things that are better than steel. <coughs> the copper, some of the copper alloys, some of the cobalt and nickel alloys are better than steel. But they're a little more pricey. So if I start combining everything, steel comes back as having this unique combination of strength and toughness. Fracture resistance. We talk about specific strength. Steel is slightly worse than aluminum. Aluminum has better strength for density than steel, but not a lot better. Simple composites are really equal to steel. Plastics are about half the strength of steels. And wood can be better than plastics. And wood's not all that different than plastics. Okay? Um, the only problem with wood is we're still running into the same problem they had in in 1600 in England, a lot of the good trees have been felled, okay, and not been certain. Now, if I but if I look at uh, high volume structural applications, when we look at cost, steel wins over aluminum five or six times. Composites, well, this is cheap composites, okay. This is like two dollars a pound is like fiberglass, okay. Uh, Ten dollars a pound might be some glass reinforced plastic, okay. Um, plastics are down here. I've got a situation now. Um, they made some some wheels on snowblowers for the tires, but the, the hubs were made out of a glass fiber reinforced plastic. The only it had sufficient strength, and as long as there's no defect, it actually has sufficient. Well, if there's no defect, you don't have to worry about toughness. But if there is a defect such as a molding defect or something, something else, which the couple I've looked at. The thing when you pressurize it to 30 PSI in your tire, goes boom, and you end up getting shrapnel in your arm or your eye. Or something like that. There's 200 of these cases around the country. The Consumer Product Safety Commission drew these from the market. There's something called fracture safe design. If you made a steel or an aluminum or any kind of metal hub, or even other types of plastic, like a nylon, a glass reinforced nylon composite. Nylon's got much better toughness than the plastic they use. They use polypropylene. And the polypropylene, if you look at it, you can't tolerate a flaw of one millimeter in size in that wheel. Without, and then pressurize it to 30 PSI. Well, it's not a snowblower. I mean, who's going to be controlling the pressure to 20 PSI when you fill up your snowblower? Okay? It's like if you use a torque wrench when you, you know, do your plumbing at home. Probably not. Um, but okay, so steel has those unique properties. Um, telling you a little bit more about the MIT connections and things. So Pellini came up with something called a ratio analysis diagram. We'll talk about that in a little bit. But Pellini, after he retired from the Naval Research Lab, uh, became a structural integrity consultant for the American Association of Railroads and a visiting senior lecturer at MIT. Okay, in what would be and so he wrote this guidelines for fracture safe and fatigue reliable design of steel structures. And one of the reasons for showing this and bringing this, Pellini developed something called the explosion bulge test. Okay, anybody ever heard of an explosion bulge test in here? <coughs> Even the Navy's getting away from it. But in the 1950s, Pellini came up, you start with a die, which is a bunch of steel plates with a hole in it about 
16 inches in diameter or something. Well, actually, well, here it is. Test plate 14 inches across, and maybe this is a foot or 10 inches. And you put it, put a test plate, oh, this way. Put a test plate across here that you want to test, which might even have a weld in it. And you take an explosive up here, and you set off the charge, and you have some nice rounded edges, and you try to blow the plate through the, through the hole. Okay? And so it turns out, here are some results of explosion bulge tests. At different temperatures, this is minus 5, 40 degrees, 60 degrees, 80, 20, 20, 40, 60, 80. Um, what's that? <coughs> Fahrenheit. There. So 25 degrees, say 80, 80 Fahrenheit. You get up here to 160 Fahrenheit, and you get nice ductile behavior. You'll start a crack, but the crack won't grow very far before, before uh, you have a problem. Whereas at lower temperatures, the plate just shatters in a somewhat thermal manner. And so this is the way that the Navy developed in the 1950s to qualify submarine steels and other things, all kinds of steels, was to do explosion bulge tests. Not a very cheap test, which is one of the reasons the Navy gets, gets away from it. But you will still have codes that will require, if you're going to have undex and things like that, you're going to have to have some codes and you will probably have to do a couple of explosion bulge tests okay, on these things. Uh, but usually in the later stages of the design, they've sort of tried to develop things away from that to a test. But so Polini wrote this book while he was here at MIT, and I think he passed away a year or two, a couple of years ago. But he basically uh, 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 was kind of the, the leading guy for developing <coughs> relationships for materials. And he came up with these diagrams called ratio analysis diagrams. Okay? So this was sort of a naval research lab development. The cause of the Liberty ships, and it's used in pipeline industries and everything else. Um, turn that down a little bit. You should have in your notes some of these plots. This is for steel. I'm going to show it to you for aluminum and titanium. This is the plain stain. Plane strain fracture toughness. Now, fracture toughness has kind of interesting units. We typically use K. Don't ask me why. I think I have read the reason. But it has units of KSI times the square root of inch. Okay, or it has megapascal um, meters to the three halves power. Okay. And that's because the basic equation for fracture toughness says that the toughness is equal to the stress times the square root of pi times the crack length. So the, by talking about a notch and how much it embrittles the material, the toughness of the material must be greater than the stress applied times the square root of pi times the crack length. And we'll go through some of this stuff later. But that's the basic equation. And so toughness has these units of KSI for stress times the square root of inches. Okay? So this is toughness, KSI square root of inches, and really, really low strength but high toughness steels might have a few hundred KSI square root of inches. This is called the plastic region. This is the yield strength of the steel. So this is strength versus toughness, just like we had on the HP plots, but this is not a log-log system. And this is what's called the technological limit. When we make steel as clean and as strong as possible, we pay a price when we get higher strength. So when we make landing gear for a Boeing 747, we might use 280 or 300 KSI steel. And it might be triple vacuum arc remelted to get rid of all the inclusions on any of those little crack starters. But it's going to have a toughness it's not going to be any better than 80 KSI square root of inch. And we'll talk later about what that means. But um, this is what they call the high quality corridor, the intermediate corridor, and the low, low quality corridor, corridor. It turns out when steels get to this type of strength, they actually behave almost like glasses. Okay? And that occurs at lower temperatures. When you have low strength steels, you actually, they don't behave like glasses at all. They actually have a fair amount of toughness, even if they're low strength. These 
lines across here tell you the critical flaw size so that if this is how big a notch you can s support. If your stress is equal to the yield stress, let's see, I'm sorry. If it's equal to the yield stress, that's this number. If it's half the yield stress, it's this number. Uh, so down here, this is ten, a 10 mil flaw. Three human hairs will cause a, the best material we know um, to, uh, well, actually, for an aircraft landing gear, about, about 20 mils, half a millimeter flaw in a landing gear would cause the thing to, to fail. Um, so the flaw size is very critical uh, for, if you're in the submarine business, you're talking about HY100 is right in here, but in fact you have to kind of talk about it in here. When people talk about HY130, we're in here, but now we have to have very good steel making practices and things like that. We're starting to fall off that cliff. There was once a time the Navy was trying to develop HY200. They actually did make some small structures out of HY180. Okay, but really they found that the tough, they just can't get the toughness in steels that they need for the type of fracture resistance they want. If I put up similar plots for aluminum or titanium, this is aluminum. Now, if I compare it, the toughness of the steels is 10,000 in what they call these diamond dynamic tear. The aluminum is five times less, even the best quality aluminum. Co prompted the head of research at uh, US Steel a number of years ago to call aluminum the near metal. Okay, he was a steel guy, but he called aluminum the near metal. But the strengths are not going up to 300 KSI in the aluminum alloys. When you get above 40 KSI, you start falling off. Whereas steels, you've got two and a half times the strength and five times the toughness. This is way down compared to the other plot. Titanium alloys, a little better than aluminum, and they got better strength, but above 100 or 120. And so if you want to know why the Navy was looking at 100 KSI titanium alloy for their submarines back in the 1980s, TI-100, just look at these plots. Okay? It's what you can get in these alloys. Okay? Now, I could do better in a cobalt alloy or nickel alloy, but I just couldn't afford it. Okay? Um, and so I once, it's a long time I know, I've ever seen anyone bother to try to plot ratio analysis diagrams of various materials on the same plot. But I once published this. Here's the steel curve, here's the titanium curve, here's the aluminum curve, here's composites, and there's polymers. And you want to be up here. It's okay to be in this region, you don't want to be in this region. This is the brittle fracture region. And so if you go to very high strengths, even steels have problems, but they're still better than titanium or aluminum. Composites, yeah, some of the best composites can sort of equal medium duty steels, but composites don't ever get over here to the best quality steel or aluminum. Titanium doesn't quite make it. And plastics, some of the plastics can be just as good as the steel. Kevlar is great, okay? But if I take some of the other plastics, they're brittle like glass. So when you're talking material selection, you actually have to know something about the plastics you're using. But if we wanna, you know, if I'm gonna be singing the praises of steel, you can see that it's just inherent. It, its properties of steel on a cost basis far exceed its make it dominant among, among everything else. So, turns out other people knew this even before we did these studies. Roger Kipling said, gold is for the mistress, silver for the maid, copper for the craftsman, cunning at his trade, good said the baron sitting in his hall, but iron cold all, iron is master of them all. So, it's not as if people didn't know this, it's that people didn't pay any attention to Billions of dollars of research have been wasted because material scientists will say, oh, I have this composite material that will is five times stronger than something else on a specific strength basis or whatever, okay? They start using modifiers. And if you're not careful, listening for those modifiers <coughs> and understanding what those modifiers mean, you're going to end up building a generator out of electrically conductive polymer, and it will be five times the size. Now there are other things, getting back to the generator, there are some materials like superconductors. 
Jim Kirtley down here in the basement of Building 10 in electrical engineering. He's kind of the world's expert on designing superconducting generators. He built one over here across the street a few years ago, and a superconducting generator will be one-tenth the size of some other generator, and that's why the Navy likes to think about building those things for ships, ship drives, you know, a motor, motor generator, basically, a superconducting. High response time, starts up quickly, right? Uh, uh, so there are things that are better than copper for that application, but it comes at a cost. Okay, again, cool, liquid heat. Uh, okay, any questions? No one else. I'm not sure I want to start a new topic right now, so maybe I'll just let you go five minutes early since I took five minutes late last time. The, the my official time for this class is basically 7.30 to 8.50s, because some people do have to get across the way in the 9 o'clock classes, right, for ESD. So I'll be here tomorrow. I won't be here Friday. I still don't know what's happening Monday, but they tell me on Thursday I'll find out.